welcome to an Ives Collective Salon concert, recorded live in a private home in Palo Alto, California, on February 16, 2020. Today, the Ives Collective performs and discusses Beethoven's Piano Trio in C minor, Opus 1, Number 3. The musicians are Susan Fryer Violin, Stephen Harrison Cello, and Elizabeth Schumann Piano. Our moderator is musicologist Derek Katz. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. I recognize some of you, and some of you I don't recognize. It's always nice to see new faces. Um, I'm going to introduce our master of ceremonies, Derek Katz, who will help take us through the C minor piano trio by Ludwig van Beethoven in a Beethoven year. Some of you have probably heard quite a bit of Beethoven, but maybe not in a setting as nice as this one. So thank you all for coming. Derek. Hello and good afternoon. So yes, here we are in 2020, once again celebrating Beethoven. I, I recently read a newspaper editorial by a friend suggesting that the, the truly appropriate way to celebrate 250 years of Beethoven would be to not play his music for a year. <laughs> and then we could, we could come back after that with a different appreciation. But So we're not taking that strategy. We're going the more traditional celebrating by playing and listening route. So the piece we're going to hear is one of three piano trios that Beethoven published in 1795 as his first work, Opus One, And I think there's sort of two obvious things to say about it, and I want to, I will say those things, but then I also want to sort of problematize them, as I feel that my job is to confuse and make things more <laughs> complex and problematic than they might otherwise be. So the first obvious thing would be to talk about the piano trio in general. And so for regulars here, you've heard part of the speech already with respect to Mozart's piano trios. But in the 18th century, in Mozart's day and Haydn's day, the piano trio was basically an accompanied sonata. The idea is it was a piece for keyboard to be played by an accomplished amateur that might or might not have a violin or a flute or a cello playing along. But the key things were first off that it was all about the keyboard, that the string parts or the flute part are sort of optional. Use them, don't use them, doesn't matter that much. And that they're not intended for public performance by professionals. It's something you do in a space like this. Amateurs, with your servants, with your family members, with your friends, if you're a member of the aristocracy, with your employees. And so clearly, Beethoven's piano shows come from a different world. They live in the world of professionals, playing them for audiences. They're more difficult. The string parts are definitely not optional. They're not just crucial. They're beautiful. They're necessary. So that, that's one thing. That's one story to tell. The other story would be about Beethoven himself, and to say that I, you know, I think for me, and I don't think this is a uh, novel or unusual idea, this is sort of the first piece for me that Beethoven really sounds like Beethoven, or at least the Beethoven of the pathetic piano sonata of the Fifth Symphony, the kind of serious, potentially stormy, almost emotionally violent Beethoven. He seems to show up unannounced in this piece in a very striking and strong way. So I think, and again, those, those would be perfectly good things to say, but again, I think it's a little more complicated than that. So I thought maybe I could sort of really begin by telling two of the most famous Beethoven stories, both of which are probably not quite true. So the first one goes like this. Beethoven went to move to Vienna from Bonn when he was about 22. And in 1792, he went there in the hopes of studying with Mozart. Mozart had just died. He had to settle for studying with Haydn. So after a year of being in Vienna, being kind of short on money, he and Haydn wrote to the elector of Bonn, who was supporting Beethoven, the stipend, and said, Beethoven has been working so hard and diligently. Please could you give him more money so that he can support himself in Vienna? And as evidence of his diligence, here are five pieces that he wrote in Vienna. And so the elector wrote right back and said, I've seen all that music already. Clearly Beethoven isn't working very hard at all, and I see no reason why he should get any more money. So it, it's a funny story, um, and the, the point is always sort of, ah, that Beethoven, what a rogue, right? Um, but it seems likely that Beethoven wasn't trying to deceive anyone, that actually the elector, not being a musician, um, not being terribly involved with musical matters, probably just looked at the basic layout of the music and said, oh, a piece for five wind instruments, I've heard one of those before. A set of variations for keyboard, I've seen one of those before. Um, it's quite likely, there's, it seems almost um, definitely true that Beethoven had in fact sent four pieces, five pieces that he'd written in Vienna, just the way he said he did. So why should we care about that? I think the reason we care about that is if those pieces actually represent what he'd been doing in that year, 
it's virtually nothing that we now hear and care about. Um, of the pieces, only one of them was published um, during his lifetime and was played regularly. That's the, the wind octet. I was trained as a bassoonist. Any other wind players in the room? I didn't think so. Okay, so <laughs> if you're not a wind player, this is probably not a piece that means anything to you. So to a certain extent, this just strengthens the idea that these three piano trios sort of came out of nowhere, that I think if somehow there's, there was an alternative universe in which Beethoven, you know, whatever, went to law school at 23 or something, and all he left was what he had written before these pieces, we would we had no sense that he was special, that he was different from Dushek or Pleyel or Kozeluk <coughs> or the competition at the time. So the second story is specifically about these piano trios. Right after Beethoven had published them, Haydn, who had been in London, came back to Vienna and attended a little sort of like this, a little salon performance where all three piano trios were played in his presence. Haydn was old, he was tired, he'd been traveling, and so according to one of Beethoven's students, somebody went to Haydn and said, so, what did you think of the piano trios? And Haydn said something along the lines of, well, they're very nice, but I probably wouldn't have published the last one, which is to say the one that you're about to hear. <laughs> so this is a story that shows up in all of the liner notes and pre-concert talks and books, and the point of the story tends to be, well, Beethoven, he was doing something new and different. Haydn, that old fuddy-duddy, he just sort of couldn't get with the program. And I've read all sorts of elaborations of that Haydn said the music was too dramatic. Haydn said the music was too difficult. Haydn said that the music wouldn't be understood by audiences of the time. N no evidence for that whatsoever. To, for me, the point of the story is not that Haydn was a fuddy-duddy, but rather that Haydn was thinking of the piano trio as he knew it. He was hearing these three pieces and thinking of them in the social niche for which they, they would have been intended in his lifetime, that is, as pieces for amateurs. And he's thinking, you know, those amateurs are not going to be able to play this piece. And it's not just that it's technically difficult, and as you hear particularly the piano part, you'll know what I'm talking about, it's emotionally difficult, it's, it's demanding, it has a, a range that we don't associate with the sort of the, the polite conversation of, of the salon or of, of the parlor. So I think, you know, Haydn was being very perceptive, and in a certain sense he was absolutely correct. These were not pieces that the amateurs of Vienna or of Paris or of London purchased in large numbers and then played in their parlors. They had to wait for the development of a concert culture in which professionals were paying them in front of pay, pay, play, sorry, playing them in front of paying audiences. So those, that's sort of the, the, the context in which I was hoping to put the piece. Specifically, the first movement you're about to hear, one of the things that strikes me is I don't know where it begins. And I think that it can be played and heard in different ways. That is to say, it starts with a gesture played by all three players <coughs> together. And this is clearly what the piece is about. So this is a little short statement. But then it seems to be, to me, followed by something that sounds like sort of a question. So it's sort of, here I am, but am I really? And then the next thing just sort of motion stops, is what we in the music business call a fermata or a whole time stops. And then something different happens. And then when there's something different happens, we're in a world which is very rhythmic. You know, ba -ba -ba -bum, ba -ba -ba -bum, ba -ba -ba -bum. It seems very, again, Beethovenian, meter-driven, rhythm-driven, energetic. But is that the true beginning of the piece? I don't know. And I think it d depends a lot on how one chooses to play it. Do you play the <coughs> opening in a sort of very distinctly and set the tempo then? Or do you feel that the beginning is sort of almost improvisatory? So I will now pose this as a question to the people that are about to play it for you and ask you, you know, was this something you thought about as, you know, when you approached the piece? I mean, I know you've all played it many times in different circumstances. And if so, how did you approach making those decisions? Well, I think we, it might be nice for us to try it both ways. I what think a couple we, of years ago we did it more or more, less as a free form introduction. Right. And I was sort of insistent that we not do it that way this time. <laughs> I, have, I, I have to admit that I, I kind of wanted there to be some tempo at the beginning of the piece. But there's, I, I, it doesn't make me right. It just, you know. Don't. Why don't we try it? <laughs> Uh, where it's more improvisatory, which we, we haven't been playing it this way most recently, but let's give it a try, a little freer. And then when, he, as Derek was saying, we'll, then we'll pick up the tempo right there, see how that, how that works. <laughs> Thank you. 
So that was a way, <laughs> which was pretty. It's nice, right? It works. It sets it the drama. Yeah. Yeah. Probably Should would have we... been something that would have been done 40, 50 years ago in piano trios, people, professional piano trios, you know, 50 years ago, Columbia, RCA, those recordings, this might have been the way they would have approached it, sort of taking a slightly Brahmsian view of how to play Beethoven, romantic period view of how to play Beethoven. So do you want to do it the other way? Do you want to have the other way just lead into the actual run through? Were you going to say some more about the first moment before that? You're sort of shaking your head. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> to you. We love, we, I love to hear you. Okay, I think the only thing I was going to say, and maybe this is just obvious now that you've heard, you know, the, the, the first 30 seconds or something like that, is that, you know, again, I think... Yeah, I think back to my own childhood when PBS was broadcasting Bernstein conducting the Vienna Phil and all of the Beethoven symphonies, and every broadcast began with a marble bust of Beethoven in the dark with thunder and lightning <laughs> crashing over over the Be Beethoven over Beethoven said, "I mean, this is that Beethoven." I think you can already hear again you know, the minor key, the agitation, and you'll hear even more of that as you get deeper into the piece. So, you know, I'm a little hesitant about this. I don't want to make it sound as if this is better. Than, than other composers' music. I love Haydn's piano trios, or even better than the other two major key trios in the same opus, which I also love just as much, but in different ways. And I, I worry a little bit that the, the thunder and lightning Beethoven has eclipsed the other Beethoven. I think even in this piece, as you listen to it, there are many moments of, of lyricism in major keys and, and relaxation. And so I think it's a bit of a problem to privilege the storminess too much. Nonetheless, you, you'll, you'll definitely hear it. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll sit down and let you guys do the thing now. So we'll do the first movement. I think the, the point was one of the points that Derek was making, it's important to, to remember that he decided that the way he wanted to introduce himself to the world was with these pieces, so he said, Opus 1, these are my first pieces. When in fact he'd written a ton of pieces in Bonn, and now you can see all of them published, and they're called, they, they go by the title Wu, without Opus, right? So there's, there's three piano quartets, there's yeah. some other things that he wrote when he was a teenager. But he wasn't, didn't want to be known by those things as his entree to, to be in. So this is, these, these Opus One words sort of going to set the pattern. It also set the pattern of the idea of pairing music that was serene, major key, largely untormented um, and stormy, with something that was tormented and stormy. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, that's a point he should have made. So the Opus One really was a big deal at the time. It's not just a, oh, this just happened to be the first thing that he right. published. And right. it wasn't just Beethoven. Composers thought very carefully about how they were going to present themselves to a commercial public for the first time. Yeah. And there was sort of a routine. The usual idea was you, you presented yourself with a set of sonatas, accompanied or not, that weren't too difficult. So, for instance, we don't talk about Mozart's works with opus numbers anymore, but some of them were published with opus numbers, and his opus one were six violin, sorry, six sonatas for keyboard and violin were published in Paris in 1778, and that was the idea. Here I am in Paris, there's a publishing industry, there's a market, here's something that amateurs can play. You're a keyboard player, you can find a friend that plays the violin, it's mostly about the keyboard. Um, and yeah, again, Beethoven frequently did that, here's something, here's something that's very different. I'm going to do them both at the same time. You're also working on the G minor cello sonata right. from about the same period. Right. F major, G minor. Right. The fifth and sixth symphonies premiered right. at the same concert. Major, uh, well, he did minor, major, major, minor in that order on the concert. Oh, did he? The other way now, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Thank you. 
So the next movement is going to be a theme in variations. And so in a certain sense, this is very simple. You need a theme. The theme almost always comes in two halves. You hear each half twice. You hear first half, first half, second half, second half. And then you hear basically either the same tune or the same set of harmonies underlying the tune over and over again. So again, you hear that same structure. Something, something again, the completion, the completion again. 
And usually in this period, the sort of the drama is increasingly elaborate embroidery. So it's not that the tempo actually speeds up, but if the, if the tune sort of goes one and two, and then the next variation will go one, two, three, two, two, three, and the one after that I go one, two, three, four, two, three, three, and then everybody's like, what, da, 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 and when you sort of run out of little divisions, then you get to a variation which is either minor or slower or both, and then once you've broken the mood, you finish up with something that sort of dances off to a happy conclusion. So why do this? I'm actually kind of fascinated by themes and variations, and in the period that we're talking about, they had at least two maybe three overlapping functions, none of which really applies to this piece, which is why, why I'm interested in it. So reason number one that we might care about themes and variations, where Beethoven would have cared about themes and variations, are they are great things to use as basis for improvisations. So Beethoven's calling card as a young man wasn't really as a composer, it was a keyboard player. And so what he did, both in Bonn, but especially in Vienna, is he would go from aristocratic salon to aristocratic salon and sit down at the keyboard and improvise. And so what he would do is show off. And you know, then that's that's the sort of the, the point is you know, here's a tune you know, here's a variation. Look, it's getting harder, look, it's getting harder. Oh my goodness, can you believe what I just did? Now I'm doing it upside down and backwards and juggling at the same time. And and then this is how he developed the sort of this group of, of patrons and supporters and friends that would support him and befriend him for the rest of his career. But you can't really do that in piano trio, right? You're, you're limited. It's not improvisatory. Everything's written down ahead of time. You have to cooperate between the three players. So there's a certain amount of showing off, but that's not really what's driving it. And then the, the other thing which I've alluded to is it was often a place to bring in something that people knew already. So um, Stephen mentioned that Beethoven wrote a lot of music before going to Vienna. One of the biggest category were themes and variations, which he, he, he didn't publish, uh, partially because of his opus one thing, it wasn't how he wanted to present himself, but also because he didn't want to give away his tricks, right? And w w once you publish the things, then people know how you did it. Um, <laughs> but they're almost all on known themes. They're on themes from popular Italian operas. Once he got to Vienna, he did a set of variations for keyboard and violin on an aria from Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro. He did a set of variations on God Save the King. And this is very, very typical. Composers like Pleyel and Dushek, if you go through their sonatas, their piano shows, there's just reams of variation movements on Scottish folk songs, on tavern songs, on Italian opera arias. But this isn't that either. Beethoven wrote the theme, so he's kind of over two and in the justification <laughs> business. And then, you know, the, the other reason for doing it would be that it would be something that people could sort of have as a souvenir and play at home. This is why Beethoven eventually did publish the themes and variations, so people could sort of stumble through them at home and figure out what the tricks were. But again, that's not that. So what's it doing here? I mean, I think it's actually very, very peculiar in a way. And eventually, we know, because we know how Beethoven's career goes, you go to the very end of his life, he becomes obsessed with themes and variations and variation principles in the last piano sonatas, the last string quartets, the ninth symphony. They're just all over the place. So sort of listening backwards, sure, of course he does it. But right now, it's actually kind of a, a bold and strange maneuver. Um, and he has to figure out a way to engage your interest without all of the things I just mentioned, without the Irish folk song or the Italian opera aria, without the, you know, whatever, playing frills with one hand while dealing poker with the other or something <laughs> like that. He just has to convince you that hearing this same set of chords over and over again is inherently interesting. And I actually think that's a, a much more difficult trick than one might think. And of course, it's, he does it very beautifully. I wanted to um, just mention a fun thing that we do in variation three for any of you that don't know, instead of using the bow, which is what you hear a lot, we have a pizzicato, which is, you know, that's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. I, I don't expect to see a pizzicato variation commonly. It, it seemed refreshing and well, fun. Well, it's actually a piano variation with Yeah, yeah, and we're, so we're accompanying <laughs> the, as best we can with yeah. our pizzicato. We're trying to mimic yeah. No, but I think piano. it's a pretty big it's deal. Because again, if you it's think, you know, only a few thing. years before, people are thinking the piano trio is something that's really just a piano sonata. You don't even need the strings. Now it's not just, oh, you need them, but we care about how you're producing the sound. It's right. not just, oh, here, oh, we, you know, whatever. We let the cello get the melody every once in a while, but we want to, yeah. you know, use the sort of full range of tone colors that are available, bowing, plucking. When we get to the last one, we'll hear a place where Stephen is instructed to play an entire passage on the C string for effect. It's a, it's very idiomatic for the stringed instruments to way that's very peculiar for yeah. a piano trio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. it is. Yeah.
So <clears throat> something I perhaps should have mentioned earlier is that this piece has four movements. You've heard <laughs> two of them. Um, and the reason you need to know this now is that the, you're going to hear the third and fourth movements without pause, which is the, you can hear them played straight through. But actually, you know, if you were somehow transported back to 1785, you were sitting next to weary old Haydn off of the boat from London listening to these pieces for the first time, you wouldn't know that. You'd be actually in some suspense because there would be two possibilities. One is you'd be hearing these pieces and say, ah, well, it's basically a piano sonata. Piano sonatas usually have three movements. I've heard the first movement, I've heard the slow movement. Two down, one to go. Um, or you might also think of this, well, it's a piece that features the piano, it's like a piano concerto. Same thing, two down, one to go. Or you could be thinking, ah, well, this is a piece of chamber music. It's like a string quartet or perhaps like a, a miniature symphony that has multiple instruments. Um, therefore, I expect four movements. And so actually Beethoven is doing something fairly um, ag aggressive in including a third movement before the last one by saying, no, this is not like one of those piano sonatas that you're familiar with. This is more like a string quartet. It's more like a symphony. Take this more seriously. And that third movement, the, the thing that's questionable, would ordinarily be a minuet. That is a court dance, which I, I think is interesting at a couple levels. On one level, and I don't want to give you like sort of like the deep history of music because we've all got places to go, things to do, <laughs> but in some sense, you know, the roots of instrumental music, particularly of orchestral music in Western Europe, go back to court dance, particularly in Paris at the court of Louis XIV. Why do you get a bunch of musicians together to play for the ballet? And so what do they play? They play minuets, they play gavots, they play rondos, what have you, and people actually dance to them. Mm -hmm. And hence, um, all of those French suites, hence the Bach orchestral suites, which are made up of those same types of dance pieces, albeit without people dancing. And the last vestige of that is the minuet, which tends to be the third movement of a string quartet of a symphony. It's that last bit of heritage where you still sort of imagine whatever it is, the piano trio, the string quartet, the orchestra, playing for a French court and people in elaborate costumes actually doing those social dances. So Beethoven includes the movement, but it's really fast and it's really rhythmically unsteady from my point of view. So you don't get that nice one ba 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 bum ba 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 sort of minuet groove that you would get from Mozart or from Haydn. And so instead of having that sense of, oh yes, this, this evokes dancing, this evokes older Europe, this evokes the aristocracy, it's more like, whoa, yeah, what are we doing here? Um, and so I think you know, this is, it's, it's a very different type of, of dynamic or, or different sense of drama. There's a lot of uncertainty, stops and starts, surprises. And one of the things that I like the most is, is the big contrast between sort of, there's sort of an outer dance and an inner dance. You get a minor section, then there's a major section. Then you go back and you hear the first thing again. So the major section in the middle, it's major, it's lyrical. There's a big cello solo. We'll enjoy hearing it, um, but it's also, and it's also something that sort of tells one story in a sense to me, which is that in the middle of the, the first thing, the minor fast one, there are a bunch of upward piano runs, which to me sounds sort of like just flourishes, like, oh, it's just sort of, isn't that nice? It's just sort of an embellishment. And then when we get to the middle section, suddenly it's the main course. It's going down instead of up. And it's like, oh, this is what it's all about. Actually, I should have cared about it more when I heard it the first time. And then, and then, then we have you hear the first thing again. It's like, oh, now I get to hear it again with, you know, with that knowledge that it's going to become important later on. So you know, again, I, never, I don't want to phrase it like, oh, look, Beethoven is so much more clever than other people. But it is, it's a different way of thinking about it. So it's sort of one story that connects this routine of something, something different. First thing again, which otherwise again could feel a little routine. Yeah, and, and for any of you who came to the Mozart one before, Mozart trios always have three movements. Yeah, they don't have the four. They don't include a minuet. They always have a, an andante or something in the middle, maybe a theme and variation sometimes, yeah. but never a minuet. And this is sort of humor on Beethoven's part. Yeah, and I I, I love to tell the story early on when I first played this piece when I first came to the Bay back to the Bay Area, pianist that I was playing with. There's these runs, these cascading runs in the trio. The first time we, we played it at a place that was called the Mozart Society of Carmel. He was a very good pianist. But on the way down, and he's, he's somewhat profane. Occasionally he will, he will say something. And on the way down, on the very first run, he stayed in minor. He played the wrong, <laughs> played the wrong thing. So, and, and I heard, shh, in the background. And he goes, you know. And then he insisted 
on doing exactly the same thing on the repeat. <laughs> <laughs> Including the cursing? In, no cursing, but exactly the same wrong note. Exactly the same wrong note, and the violinist and I were just laughing. <laughs> that was hilarious. He committed to the shtick, right? <laughs> he, had, he wasn't going to give away that he yeah. messed it up the first time. He did exactly the same wrong note the second time. <clears throat> but there'll be no more notes. Yeah. So, so you hear that. <laughs> And then just a, just like a sentence, so then when we do get to the last movement, again, I think it's a bit of a surprise. In the sort of the, the late 18th century, we would expect the last movement to be dance-like, to be happy again, a kind of frolic to the finish. And this one isn't. It, it's back to, you know, again, to the stormy, serious Beethoven. And again, I think there's a little bit of a call back to the first movement in is that there's, it starts very um, sort of, you know, distinctly and aggressively, but that's not really the beginning, it turns out. It turns out to be a bit of an introduction, and then it's, oh, once again, there, there's a second beginning, sort of. Did you hear it that yeah, way as well? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. And then also back at the minuet, the quasi allegro, is a is that very common in Beethoven? I mean, or yeah, he wrote. It's so talking, surprising. Yeah, Beethoven just couldn't make up his mind. What I mean, the, the quasi is about? Yeah. right. Kind of allegro. The, the yeah, classic yeah. Beethoven sort marking of is allegro. not something sort of I fast. expect. Quite quickly, but not too quickly, but kind yeah. of slowly and with feeling, but not too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also sentiment. Yeah, right. <laughs> a little bit. Well, this is how we interpret that. Yeah.
yeah. It's also weird the way it ends, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's so petite, right? It's nothing. Pianissimo, pianissimo to nothing. Yeah, that's... He, he drew the attention of the audience rather than slamming it over their heads, right? Yeah. Anyone well, have any, any questions? comments or questions or anything at all? Questions? Janet, you're always good for a question. <laughs> Are you here? I was just thinking I should come up with something, but it was too perfect. <laughs> 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 I have a little bit of a kind of tough question. I have. Sure. You, you mentioned about how important that first piece is when someone's new mm -hmm. on the scene, and it seems, and maybe it's unfair to characterize it this way, but it seems in the first and the third that he's almost giving the public a little bit more of what they want. Uh -huh. And then he's capturing more of what he wants in some of these darker two and four movements. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. I mean, I think, I mean, yes. The thing that's striking to me is that he didn't have to give the public something because he had other people paying for it, in a sense. I mean, I mean one of the things I didn't get to is that, um, so the whole the idea of the Opus One usually was that a composer would fund it himself with the idea of then presenting oneself to the public, and then once you've established to a publisher that you can sell six sonatas, then the publisher says, well, okay, I'll buy the next set from you. And Beethoven, because of his aristocratic, very wealthy pals in Vienna, really never had to play that game. So I, I promise you I won't go into the details. I once absolutely horrified a, a graduate class by going through florin by florin, <laughs> ducat by ducat, <laughs> how, this, how this particular publication was, was supported. But essentially, even though it was published, it wasn't really a commercial venture. What happened is that Beethoven essentially paid the publisher to engrave the plates and make the copies. They then, so then Beethoven had a store of things that he could sell, but he sold them all to his friends and patrons. So like, I forget the, I mean, he had, I know he had, he had 120 people. copies and 87 of them went to Prince Lichnowsky's family or something. <laughs> Lichnowsky yeah. wrote 20 and bought 20 of them. His aunt wrote it, bought another 20. So, and then after that, the publisher bought the plates back. So Beethoven made back the money he'd already spent on that. Then the publisher could sell them outside of Vienna. So Beethoven was essentially getting paid two or three times yeah. over for the same piece. But he never had to sort of please a public in that way to have the financial success of the venture rest and having a supply of pianists sufficient to buy enough copies to pay the engraver, to pay for the paper, to pay for the ink or, or what it, have It was you. the one aspect of his life which was, uh, the one aspect of his life that wasn't about music that he was very careful to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. uh, was the publishing aspect. Money. Uh, yeah. uh, money. Mo the money aspect of music. Because anybody who went to his house was horrified at the way he lived. I mean, <laughs> he just, we, he was, yeah, it was really bad. And, and he, he, he lived, he, he cared about nothing except writing the music and getting paid for the music. Mm -hmm. So because there were no copyright laws in those days, he might publish the same piece with seven different publishers. Mm -hmm. And so the publishers really had to grab it quick and sell it quick before somebody else published it because there was no copyright law. So he, um, yeah, he really had to do that. Do we have any idea who else played this piece during Beethoven's lifetime? Really, no, and that, that's a fascinating thing. I mean, I would love to know these things, but for most of the famous pieces... Well, we know he played the piano part they're, they're, in, the well, early in the earliest times. I mean, like, once, one. at least. No, I mean, but, the people, I mean, well, I do mean, like, like, would other aristocratic people have bought it for their musicians? Well, but, but, but that's the thing. It's like there's really great ignorance about this. And I would love to be able to tell yeah. you, oh, this was regularly done in certain circumstances. But, you know, this is actually, as I say, this is actually an extraordinarily well-documented situation. You, you can find reproductions of the actual subscription list and find out that Countess so-and-so signed up for seven copies, and Prince so-and-so signed up for ten copies. But we don't know what happened to them after that. So they bought the ten copies. Maybe they went into a cupboard. Maybe they were given out as party favors. Maybe they were <laughs> playing them. And if we're lucky, maybe there's one like third-hand account where somebody says, ah, went to private entertainment at the home of Count so-and-so. Beethoven was in attendance. Somebody else played piano part of some sonata. And we think, well, maybe it was this one because he'd written it recently. But no, there were really. there were a lot of great pianists in Vienna. There who were, were professionals, composers who were pianists, but we don't actually know whether Dussek played this or. Well, there are also a lot of great pianos 
pianists were amateurs. And that's another thing is every once in a while somebody would go through Vienna and like sort of publish a list of the best pianists in Vienna. And, yeah. and most of them were A, aristocrats, B, women, C, amateurs. Right. Or maybe that's not the ABC order, but. Um, right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. So it would have been played, it might have been played. But I mean, there wasn't really any place for the, for the piano trio on a public concert. I mean, there were hardly any German music concerts in the first place. The only series anywhere in Europe, um, and not even at this time, 10 years after this time, uh, was put on by uh, Ignaz Schaponzig. Right. And that was all string quartets. He made a big deal of not including pianists, of not including piano troops. So that was seen as too popular. Right. You know, but not, not pure enough, not elite enough for the quartet <laughs> audience. So it's a really big mystery. I mean, there were hundreds of copies of it floating around in different cities in right. Europe, and we don't know what they did with it. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> yes, do, do any of these copies survive anywhere? Sure. I mean, I mean actually, um, you know, it's one of these things, if, if you go online, the first editions are still circulating around. There are, there are antiquarian publishers will be happy for very large sums of money <laughs> selling you one of those original printings that are, that are still floating around. But we, but we don't know what happened to them in between. I must say, the couple times I've had my paws on them, they sure don't look like anyone played them, at least not very much. I mean, they're not dog, you know, you, you, yeah. look, look, look what happens to music, right? I mean, you know, you, you, you got to turn the pages, and you put markings in, and you know, none of that. They, they, they tend to be very clean. They have the look of things that were prized possessions rather than that got, got serious use. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I have a question about uh, how smart Beethoven was uh, in terms of um, so the piano piece, the piano part is very virtual. Virtuosic. Yeah. Difficult. Yes. <laughs> but he must have been going for a market. So what, uh, how did he approach the virtuosity of the violin and the cello parts, and was that a difficulty? Was, did he want to allow this to be more accessible to, to amateur It's violins? a really good question. I mean, I'll, I'll defer I think he, to I think he knew colleagues. pretty early on, he knew professionals. Schuponzig he met fairly early right. on. Um, but, but he was using these as vehicles, at least at the beginning, for himself. But again, this is something I don't quite understand, though, because yes, what you've just said is true. On the other hand, we know at this period, you know, he was traveling, he went to Berlin, he, he went, went to Dresden, Prague, he went to Leipzig, yeah. he went to Prague, and everywhere along the way, people were saying, Beethoven, write a piece for me, you know, write, write a piano quartet, write a string quintet, write string trios, and these weren't professionals, and he went ahead and wrote the pieces, and people sat on them for a year, for two years, presumably playing them, or maybe hiring professionals to play them for them, but there weren't that many professionals, you know, even, even in, in Prague or Berlin. So it's, it's really kind of a mystery to me, because at least notionally, the, the idea was, yeah, that you'd publish these things and they'd be accessible to, to the amateurs who, who would buy them. Right. And, you know, not just Beethoven going all the way through to, you know, however many years later, 70 years later to Dvorak, was in these fights with publishers, where the publishers say, well, can't you publish something that the amateurs can play? And then the publishers say, well, I just did. It's not so bad. And the publishers say, oh, yes, it is. Nobody can. <laughs> so I think that there is a, a sense in which composers either didn't care or, or weren't that smart about it, that they weren't really thinking about the needs of, or at least Beethoven wasn't. I think yeah. a lot of other composers were. And you know, alas, I think that's why we tend not to compare about those other, com care about those other composers, because they were, they were too practical. They were writing pieces that now seem to us not intellectually and technically complex enough, but they were just meeting the market. And and Beethoven didn't have music. to do that. There's a lot of music from that time that yeah. nobody knows. That, I mean, very rarely gets done, unless it's written for exactly the right instrument that, that you know, somebody unless needs a... Unless it's a bassoon part, and we'll play Right, anything. you need a bassoon yeah. part, or you need a flute player, need, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Dusek, that's the only time I played Dusek, is for a flute, a flute concert. Yes. So, if, um, I'm, I'm thinking then about these pieces as art and expression. Did these things where he had them in his repertoire and would play them ongoing, he'd pull from things he'd done and perform them, or did he just sort of create them and then leave them and move on to the next thing? Well, it, it sort of depends on the type of piece. I mean, first off, Beethoven played in public, as we would understand it, very, very infrequently. Mm -hmm. So when he was playing for an audience, again, it would be more like this. It would be an aristocratic salon with a sort of an invited audience of aristocrats where he would be sitting. You know, there wouldn't be printed programs. And again, by and large, we don't know what he was playing. And so I think there's a sense that he would play pieces until people knew them, you know, until sort of the, the novelty had worn off. 
Um, but you know, sometimes pieces, again, would sort of belong to a particular aristocrat, so he could have played them in somebody else's home. Certainly with the big public pieces, I mean, the one thing he did play in public were piano concertos, and that was a sense of certainly sort of having a shelf life. You would play a piece for maybe about a year, a year and a half, or something like that. But again, that's only maybe two or three performances, and then people had heard him do it, and then he would publish it. And only then, and then as soon as he published it, he would stop playing it. And usually at that point, he'd have another, he'd have another one ready to go. So the point at which the third concerto was, was, was hot to trot was the point at which we stopped hearing the, the first concerto. Uh -huh. <laughs> On to champagne and... <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>